Can you believe that the public needs to understand more fully the issues and what is required to make changes that are essential to survival, survival of our health care system? It would be arrogant of us to try to get you to believe that we have all the answers. We do not. What we do have is a clear understanding that there is no single simple fix to such a complex problem. And we'll outline the issues as the evening goes forward. Uh, first, we're going to have uh, Richard Sayon. Uh, uh, Richard is an economist and uh, academic here in New Brunswick, uh, who is an expert on, uh, on health care, our subject for this evening. And uh, we'll invite him up to do his uh, presentation. So here is uh, Richard Sayon. And I believe that we're on the cusp of great change in this province. So it's a bit the same kind of situation that we face in New Brunswick. If we want to maintain health care and the public services that we have as they are right now, there are some things that are going to have to change, and not just within this province, but also in terms of our relationship with Ottawa. We start with good stuff. We start with the fun part. And uh, the fun part to me is, uh, I realized talking about New Brunswick's demographics for the last five years is that People tend to see, tended to see me as the prophet of doom and the guy for gloom and doom and the neoliberal who just wants to cut. So now when I start my presentations, I say that, and this, I'm not saying that with a tongue in cheek, I'm saying this seriously. Population aging, which is the topic of my conversation here tonight, is the single best thing that's ever happened to us as a society. Aging is a luxury or a privilege that is reserved to those who remain alive, okay? <laughs> So at the turn of the uh, 20th century, the typical Canadian, or Westerner for that matter, did not live well beyond, could not expect at birth to live well beyond the age of 50. For the longest while, we never made any progress in terms of our life expectancy. And then all of a sudden, life expectancy went through the roof. From 1900 to 1950, life expectancy expanded from 50 years old to 70. Basic stuff. It's not technology yet. Technology comes in later. Providing people with three basic things. Cleaner air, safe drinking water, safe food. So we did that through basic stuff. And what did that do? Well, the basic result from that is that infant mortality, which was a curse afflicting parents from you know, times immemorial, times immemorial, one out of five children would not live to the age of five about close to half, it's, I think it's one third, or close to half or something like that, of annual deaths were children below the age of five. Why? Because of infectious diseases carried by water, air, and, uh, and uh, food. So once you did that, you allowed children to reach a normal lifespan. Now, economists talk with facts, and I'm gonna have a bunch of facts with you, for you today. And uh, th these facts are tell a story, and it's important to tell that story. And what you see there, the base of the pyramid is obviously the baby boom. In Canada, the baby boom lasted. There's three countries that had a baby boom, Canada, uh, Australia, and the United States. We tend to think the baby boom is a Western phenomenon. Everyone had a baby boom. That's not true. Immigration societies had, Western immigration societies had major baby booms. So Canada was part of that, and what you see there, New Brunswick, by the way, had one of the strongest baby booms in all of Canada. Two reasons mainly for that. The first one is, was a more rural province, and rural areas tended to have more kids, but the second reason is that uh, we had a strong proportion of Catholics. So what you're seeing there is that the base of the pyramid is moving up, and now baby boomers in 71 were between the ages of five and 24, and now they're between the ages of, uh, unless I'm wrong, it's 54 and se to 73. That's the top of the pyramid, and it's moved up, okay? So the typical New Brunswicker now is 46 years old. Now, let's think about that for a minute, what it means. 46 years old, we can talk about improving birth rates as much as we want in this province, but you have to remember, the typical female is 46. 70% of adult females in New Brunswick are above 40, okay? So we can improve the fertility rates maybe, but the birth rates is gonna be hard because we're gonna reach the age of 50 soon unless things change. So unless we have immigrants who tend to come with and are much younger, don't expect the birth rates to go up. One first point that's really interesting to note is that 20 years ago, there was no age differences among regions. All regions were more or less the same median age, 36, okay? 
because baby boomers were still in those age groups. So the, the bulk of your population was in the center. 20 years later, the typical uh, person in northern New Brunswick is above 50. Okay, so we, we make in, in northern New Brunswick is 42% gain in 20 years. In the rural south, just to show that it's a rural urban thing, in the rural south, the gain is 36. And in the urban south, the gain is 22. A typical person in the urban south is about 42, 43. In Dieppe, it's 39. What you see is that in barely 20 years, the north has lost 50, it's 46, I believe, 46% of its youth. 46. That's, think about the future pool of nurses for francophone parts of New Brunswick, okay? That's the main pool. That's where the bulk of the population is. The population is aging across Canada. We have more seniors across Canada. We have more seniors. The share of seniors as an overall population, that's the different thing. Things can happen that are going to change New Brunswick's trajectory. And now I can talk about something else in the future. There's two ways to grow an economy. Economists will tell you that economic growth is a complex phenomenon, and in detail, it's very complex. But when you're looking at the bigger picture, there are two ways to grow an economy. The first one is to grow the number of workers, and the second one is to grow the value of what every worker produces. Look at the progression of New Brunswick and Canada. That's 1977, and that's 2007, 2008. I spoke about New Brunswick going through a breakdown, if you want, in 2008 with baby boomers retiring. The number of workers has gone down since 2013, about 10,000, 11,000 since 2013. In 2015, we had a, a, a drop in the exchange rate, a drop in interest rates, a drop in the oil prices. That's supposed to stimulate your economy. In the past, it would have made the economy grow by about 3 4%. What we did is barely 0.9, 0.8%. And now we're down to 0.1 in 2018, at a time when the rest of North America is growing quite strongly. Okay? We're at the tailwind of a business cycle, but the economy is still growing. It was still growing, but not in New Brunswick. Immigration is the only source of labor force growth across Canada nowadays, only, okay? New Brunswick's labor force growth is the only province that declined, the only province that saw decline over the past 10 years. With a population that's aging, you should expect New Brunswick to hire more workers in healthcare and social assistance. Social assistance includes nursing home workers, okay? What we thought would happen in terms of number of people employed in healthcare and social assistance to grow up, to grow, that's what happened. It's logical. I would tell you that so far, population aging only played a minor role in New Brunswick's fiscal deterioration over the past 10 years. So Nova Scotia is aging just as fast as New Brunswick. So if aging was the only reason, then you know, you'd, you'd probably uh, not see uh, such a stark difference. So when the Harper government vacated uh, room in the goods and services tax, it went from seven to, five to six to five percent. Nova Scotia scooped it up in 2010 by increasing its provincial sales tax. Just that, it's easily two billion dollars that were not put to the debt in Nova Scotia. Second element in terms of difference between Nova Scotia and New Brunswick is that New, New Brunswick, once the, what we call the Great Recession and the major trigger, the financial crisis, we used it as an excuse to spend our way to I don't know where, okay? Main driver of New Brunswick debt over the past 10 years was not deficits. It was borrowing to invest on all sorts of capital projects. In New Brunswick, we can't talk about the economy, you can't talk about healthcare, you can't talk about public finances without talking about Ottawa. Simple as that. For every dollar that New Brunswick sends to Ottawa, it gets two in return. So what I'm saying here is that you cannot look at uh, New Brunswick's fiscal situation without looking at federal transfers, and they've been much less generous over the last 10 years or so than they were before. This is an important point because you can't talk about the future of healthcare without understanding where federal transfers are going. My argument is that without a further reinvestment from Ottawa, healthcare as we know it, free, universal, in 10 years from now will not be sustainable. I say 10 years, it can be eight, it can be 12, but it won't be sustainable. I think that Ottawa's gotta re-engage, and dramatically so. Now, real per capita provincial health spending, Canada, New Brunswick. This is an important chart. New Brunswick and Canada track each other closely. Why? 
fundamentally because you can't, you don't live on an island. Resources are available, but they're mobile, and provinces compete for resources. It's just normal, okay? Historically, healthcare has grown at a very fast pace. There was a lull in the 1990s when Ottawa tried to balance its book off the backs of the provinces, and then they reinvested at the fastest pace in the history of CIHI data, and then for after the Great Recession, everyone tr went through hard times for a variety of reasons, and we slowed down considerably. In fact, we slowed down very sharply, which means that real spending in New Brunswick has gone down sharply uh, on an average annual basis uh, over uh, the last little while until recently. New Brunswick, facing a dire situation, managed to lower its spending considerably compared to previous years, even more than Canada, but now it's re-engaged and it's spending at about the same pace as the rest of Canada. If healthcare was a single jurisdiction, if healthcare was a national jurisdiction, you wouldn't have competition for spare, scarce resources among provinces, and maybe you could contain the growth in compensation better than under the current situation. But at, under the current situation, a lot of provinces, poorer provinces, have a choice between seeing its ability to attract future professionals decline, deteriorate considerably at a time when its needs are growing fast, or compete. Okay? And some provinces that are wealthier than uh, New Brunswick are starting to re-engage. And you should expect, if history is any guide, that some provinces will eventually re-engage, and you should see that curve going up again. Okay? So that's the reality that New Brunswick faces. It would be nice to say that we live on an island and we're just going to freeze salaries and uh, wage and conditions and nothing's going to happen because the borders are closed. But that's not the way it works. And if you want to maintain quality health care services, uh, New Brunswick's going to have to keep up for, I don't know. Now, when you slow down spending very considerably, it has an impact, okay? It truly has an impact. And in New Brunswick, you can see that it has had an impact in terms of finding efficiencies at the outset, at least. If you look at Vitalité, Horizon, the total number of employees, despite the fact that our population are, is aging and that our needs are growing, the total no number of employees based on annual reports is going down, has gone down. I'm not saying it's going down now, but it's gone down over the past eight years. And maybe some of that was efficiencies. Now it's probably that you can't find the workers anymore, but for a while, when spending went lower, that you had an adjustment and the number of employees went down. But it's not the only thing that changed with, uh, with uh, the, the spending reductions over the decade. The other thing that's changed is the, what, let's call this indicators of healthcare quality maybe, or not quality, but timeliness of mostly elective procedures. I'm not saying that cancer patients are not being seen within the prescribed times. I'm not saying that the system is falling apart, but if you look at things like hip replacement, you have a sharp deterioration in the procedures that are being done on within the recommended time frames. Same thing on knee replacement, same thing on cataract surgery. Overall, the deterioration in New Brunswick is sharper than in the Canada on average. Here are the scary data. When we look at the consequences of aging, we haven't seen anything yet. You know, we tend to think that New Brunswick is faced with a major crisis on healthcare because we, we're running out of nurses, we're running out of uh, our resources, but we haven't seen anything yet, okay? This is a chart that you're probably familiar with by now. This is the curve of healthcare spending <coughs> by age group. Baby boomers right now are here. The first baby boomer is 73 years old. S health spending at the age of 65, based on the data from CIHI, is about $5,000 per person, a bit more than $5,000, and when you end up at the age of 85 or so, it's about 20, 25,000. So it's, it's about four or five times more. Now, our baby boomers are here, so they haven't moved there yet. And much of this is inevitable. Like, we, a lot of people are gonna say that, well, we, we just need to figure out ways to be more efficient. But some of this is simply that we have we're gonna have way more seniors coming into the system. Not all seniors are uh, sick, or not all seniors need care. But the unfortunate reality is that the, ager, the older you are, the higher the rate of mortality within your age cohorts, okay? And in New Brunswick, chronic diseases, Stefan's gonna talk about that, chronic diseases are an important factor. 
But the last months, last year of life are very expensive for the system. I don't want to go into ethical issues about the last uh, year of life, but that's why you're going to see a major growth in healthcare spending as uh, baby boomers go through that because we're going to have a lot of baby boomers age 65 plus. New Brunswick is going to be much higher than in the rest of the country. This is the uh, projection of population for people age 65 to 74 and then people age 75 and above. The growth in the number of people age 65 to 74 is over, okay? Baby boomers are there, so it's over. It's not going to grow much anymore. So you're going to have more than double in the number of people age 75 plus, and that's why I'm saying that we've barely seen the tip of the iceberg yet. And that is a sure bet because seniors do not move, okay? Once after the age of 65, there's not a lot of mobility in the senior population. So this is something we need to be ready for. And just for, as an exercise, I looked at the work of the Auditor General in terms of the number of nursing home beds that would be needed if we don't change the way we do business in this province. And our predictions are the same as the one I came up with. It could grow from around 5,000 right now, it's a, I think it's a little lower than that, to about 11,000 in uh, 20 years from now. Okay, so that reality of healthcare spending is still ahead of us. We, in terms of the impact of aging. So, I have a bunch of scenarios that I'm not going to discuss because it's too complicated and I'm running out of time. But you can expect as a baseline scenario for your labor force growth to continue declining. If it wasn't for immigration, it, it, it declined much faster. That's the red line. And you can expect your growth, even with the best possible outcome in terms of immigration, to not be above about 1% historically it was about 2, 2.3 percent. So growth is not going to save us, okay? In terms of health transfers, unless things change, the money from Ottawa, as it's currently scheduled, is not going to grow, okay? This is the baseline is in red. We can expect CST, CHT to be about 2.7 percent growth, lower than Alberta, lower than in uh, Manitoba, lower than in Ontario, because our population is not growing as fast. And we can expect equalization growth to be roughly, that's a little more tough to, to predict, but it's about 3%, and the economy is going to grow at about 3%, okay? So unless you can maintain your spending within 3%, you've got a, a fiscal challenge. The only way that healthcare spending can be sustainable in the years ahead in New Brunswick is if you do not grow your uh, non-aging related spending at all. The single biggest thing that we can do is draw way more immigration in this province. We succeeded in growing our, our immigration very considerably in the last three or four years, but still, with the cu current levels that we have at about 4,000 annually, it's not enough. Just to maintain our labor force stable, just stabilize the labor force, we're talking about perhaps 10,000 immigrants annually, just to sustain, not make any gains at all on the labor force, okay? So, but immigration, core central pillar of our future ability to fund uh, healthcare. And by the way, for those who believe that it's not doable, immigration, the jobs, what's different relative to 10 years ago is that the jobs are here. The single biggest priority of employers in New Brunswick nowadays is finding workers, not finding clients necessarily. So that the jobs are here and that's why immigration, we can ramp up immigration considerably in this province without making <coughs> miracles. Reforming healthcare delivery is important for a variety of reasons. <coughs> My suspicion is that we're going to talk about reforming healthcare delivery for reasons that are not fiscal before we talk about the fiscal pressures. We're going to talk about that because of labor shortages, okay? Ottawa can do it. We're cheap to bail out. Atlantic Canada weighs about 7% of the overall Canadian uh, population, and in 20 years from now, it'll weigh about 5 point something percent, okay? We're declining. We're cheap to bail out. But if we don't show that we're leaders in reforming the way we do business, Ottawa is just code word for the rest of Canada, whose center of gravity is moving west politically, demographically, and economically. So we need to show that we're leaders in terms of being good fiscal stewards to have a good conversation with Ottawa. I don't, I'm not entirely sure that we are in a good position right now to argue with Jason Kenney, Scott Moe, and Mr. Ford, whatever, it's Doug or Rob, I think it's Doug, uh, that we need more money right now. They're going to look at us and they're going to say, well, what have you done to help yourself first and 
hopefully uh, we'll have a different conversation with different people down the road. And I'm concluded with this. I think that Canadians will care about New Brunswickers aging in dignity. If you look at social security, income support in this country, it has been federalized in the 1950s. It was supposed to be provincial jurisdiction, but Ottawa took it over. And now, typically in New Brunswick, we get twice as much money on old age security, guaranteed income supplements. Why? Because we have more seniors and our seniors are poor. And it's only normal, it's only fair, that because we're all Canadians, that we should all age in dignity, no matter where we live in terms of a postal code. But healthcare is not a federal jurisdiction, it's provincial. And given the way constitutional politics have evolved over the last 30 or 40 years, I'm doing a PhD on political science these days, and I can tell you, it's not gonna happen that healthcare is gonna become a federal jurisdiction. So we're gonna need more help. We're gonna need more help from Ottawa to allow New Brunswickers to age in dignity. And next we're going to have Stéphane Robichaud, who is the CEO of the New Brunswick Health Council, an organization he's been with since its founding in 2008, and uh, he has lots to tell us. So everyone, please welcome Stéphane. What we're facing is simply the results of the decisions we've made over those decades. So it's not like everything's fine and we're living a crisis. We've actually delivered where we're at today. Our health system in the 50s, uh, going back to the 50s, there was a very strong uh, population support for a program that would make sure that if families, individuals are hit by illnesses, that it would not bankrupt us. Countries around the world were going through the very same types of debates. And we made two fundamental decisions. In the late 50s, we decided we would pay for everything that's provided in hospitals. And then going into the early 60s, we decided we'd pay for everything provided by doctors. So no surprise today in the Canadian <laughs> environment that we talk about hospitals and doctors. Other countries had a far wider approach to this public policy, but that's how we started this journey. Now, I'd ask you to put yourself in the shoes then of the provincial governments of the day. This decision is made, all provinces has got to move forward, and we're gonna pay for what's done in hospitals. So if you kind of think about the beginning of that period, and interestingly, our current uh, uh, health minister is uh, related to the premier of the day, and, and there was a lot of debate about what's this gonna cost and so on and so forth. But at the beginning, it's, it's very normal to understand the push. We needed to make sure we're covering the whole province, okay? So there was a push on hospitals and making sure they're everywhere. And, and there's, it's not by surprise that we have many hospitals named by religious groups because they're the ones that mostly were managing this at the time and municipal groups and so on and so forth. The government was taking over this. And there's a push to spread and then came doctors and a push to spread those as well. So when you're looking at the 60s, there was a very strong push. So when Richard was showing that graph, you see that ex expenses were going way beyond inflation. We're pushing, we're pushing, we're pushing. Now from a provincial context, and I'm, in some of my time, I spend time looking at debates from the days and so on and so forth, and I can tell you right from the beginning, this thing was off the rails, like this is gonna cost too much, and you read the, 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 the debates, that's how it started. In the 70s, there was also a number of realizations about some, of the, some important things we needed to do. There were some public health officials that would say, we, cur we currently do not have the information to guide our planning in deciding the right types of service and levels of service needed by the population. We are not currently equipping ourselves to understand the needs of the population as we're making these decisions moving forward. This was the 70s. So through the 70s and 80s, we saw a big push uh, in trying to control this. We, you know, we're trying to see that, okay, we're everywhere, but how do we stop this thing from growing? Come the 90s, the idea at the time was restructuring. So we went from dozens and dozens of hospitals to eight hospital corporations in 1992. Eight hospital corporations. Then in the early 2000s, we went from eight hospital corporations to what's called eight regional health authorities. 
The thinking was the hospital corporation was kind of maintaining this thinking that health is about the walls within the walls of hospitals and wanting to get the system to start thinking more about outside the walls of the hospitals. And then in 2008, we had a reform. We went from eight health authorities to two, and that's where the Health Council was created. The Health Council has a dual mandate, and as it, at this time, and what was happening in all our jurisdictions, uh, Western provinces had health quality councils before us. And when you think about it, a lot of the pressure was saying, how are these decisions being made? And we need to have better information. And, and the public has a right to be informed. But those making the decisions aren't necessarily informed on the decisions they're making, because decisions in healthcare is a power game. Doctors, nurses, I can go to the list of professions, then go through diseases, then go through jurisdictions, parochialism, North, South, English, French, whose turn is it now? Okay? So that's how decisions to this day are still mostly being made. So the council's dual mandate was to do public reporting on health system performance, looking at our, our health in New Brunswick and health service quality. And Richard shared, it is a quality indicator that he shared about access to surgery, timely access. And this other part is engaging citizens in improvement of health service quality. And we are also required, based on our learnings, to make recommendations to the Minister of Health. Now, what we learned right from the start was that we were organized for inequity. And it was 50 years in the making, okay? And also, that as a system, it was very data rich. There's a lot of numbers, data. Uh, my very first trip to Fredton in this job, I drove back with binders this thick. People were so happy to give them to me, saying, <laughs> we've got the info. But nobody reads the binders. I did not either, by the way. <laughs> I'm not stupid. Like, I know when I'm being taken for a ride. So we did not have right information. And we were data rich, information poor. And so what that told us as a council is in our, as our, in our approach, we're going into a system here that does not have a history of working with numbers. So engagement was extremely important. If we were gonna start producing numbers, the last thing we wanted was having people argue on whether the number's right or not. I had one year experience in one of our hospital corporations and every time the uh, report, a provincial report would come out, if we were doing well provincially, it was a good report. If we're top three, it's a good report. If we're doing bad, it's not a good report. And people were right, like people weren't measuring things the same way and it's important to do that. So as a council, a lot of our work in the early years was working very closely with the health authorities, various departments and so on, making sure if we're using these numbers, will you accept the numbers? What came after that was they did not like the results, but they couldn't argue on the numbers. They validated the numbers. Now, this is just a quick look at, from our information perspective, we have a population, a population health model where, to help us organize our indicators across the province. And I won't be covering all of that this evening, but um, health service quality actually only accounts, based on our model, about 10% influence on the health of a population. Richard did a great job early on at introducing the types of things that have had a huge impact on our health, right? And on the, on the left, on the right-hand side, when you look at social economic factor, our model weighs that about 40%. Health behaviors, 40%. Physical environment, 10%. Just the model itself from a public policy perspective, when we first introduced that in the government machinery, made a lot of people react. Because you're telling me Healthcare is 10% influence, 40% of our budget. Dennis Furlong, some of you may remember him, uh, as Minister of Health, often told me, he said, when I was Minister of Health, I wanted to take millions out of healthcare and put it into uh, healthy behaviors and more of an impact on, on, on behaviors and so on, uh, uh, economic uh, impact and so on and so forth. So our model of organizing information is based on this type of uh, framework and a very key element for us very early on was understanding the importance that health services in itself when it comes to the health of a population has a very small impact. There was no history of measurement in the system so early on what we did 
as, as for our part, is we introduced care experience surveys. Part of our work is to measure satisfaction with services, but our tool goes way wider. So we don't just ask people, are you satisfied? A quick lesson we learned on that was numbers were misleading. So the few surveys that were done sporadically had very high satisfaction rates, okay, in the, high, in the 90s. But here's what happens is people will say they're satisfied because we have amazing people working in our system. And when you think about the service, you think about the interaction with that individual. So they tend to put a very high rating because the individual with, with whom they interacted was extremely nice. We asked them, did they explain to you what to expect when you went home? No. <laughs> you know, and then a whole list of questions and they say no, 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 no. They don't know what to expect, right? They know they had a very good service, the person was very helpful and so on, and that is also very, uh, very, very important. So we developed uh, a three-year cycle, first year, uh, in 2010, we did acute care is hospital services. All this information is available on our website. You can go to our website, see the info. Um, so hospital services, about 5,000 respondents. Uh, primary health services is all first points of contact. That's approximately 14,000 New Brunswickers every three years. That gives us information about their experience with services, but also other related info about chronic conditions and so on that I'll talk to you about in a second, but very valuable information. And that high number is because we've divided the province in 33 communities. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. And we want numbers for all of those. So to get the minimal numbers by community would be 13,005. Every year we do it, we reach about 145. On surveys in New Brunswick, our response rates are about 45%. Okay, other jurisdictions I mentioned earlier who do similar work, they're between 25 and 30. So we're very fortunate that New Brunswickers are participating at this rate. We do put a lot of effort, but we're, you know, we're crossing our fingers and trying to hope that we're, we're gonna be benefiting by that type of support for a while. <laughs> Home care services are two things. So here it's extramural services. We get the list of clients, we survey them, and all services that are subsidized through social development. So we get the list of clients and we survey them as well. All of the survey results are all available on our website. We take the time to debrief on these with all the service organizations, provide them the info. But what I want you to keep in mind is prior to this, there was no history of this type of work being done. So our system has evolved in absence of that type of info and many other types of indicators that we'll be running through you. Here, the province, for those that may not know, has seven health <coughs> zones. So southeast being zone one, zone two, zone three, zone four, zone five, six, and seven, Miramichi. You may see from where you're sitting little thin lines behind those bigger black lines. I don't expect you to see all the, of them. Those are the communities. So we've subdivided over the years each zone by communities to try to get closer to citizens. Is there more we would learn if we're able to get our numbers more local? And that, in our 10 years of work, when we reached that point at about the five year mark, is where things started to get very interesting. Because before that point, we were working with provincial numbers, which are important. Things like we know New Brunswick has among the highest obesity rates, we have some of the highest numbers of people who assess their mental health uh, in a poor way. So, and it's important to know that. But if I take obesity, New Brunswick, and I tell you, New Brunswick has an obesity issue. Obviously, it's not this room, right? <laughs> right, it's the rest of, of New Brunswick, right? So when we were able to break down the numbers locally, what we saw was a huge uptake on this because it was about their communities. All of a sudden, people were saying, oh, this is our community. What I want you to take away from this is not as much the numbers themselves, but that column at the far right, variability. And I'm gonna explain it to you. So you got the two columns. The first one is the provincial average. And what's called variability is we've taken the lowest uh, uh, community and the highest community. And what you have to remember here is, it's never the same community that's the lowest, and it's never the same community that's, well, never rarely the same community that's at both ends. 
That's an important learning that we got out of this, is just how important it is to understand realities across New Brunswick, because when you're looking at this provincially, there's a risk that you're really not understanding certain realities. And it really speaks to the importance, and I told you, our services have not evolved with an understanding of our needs from a population perspective. These types of numbers are starting to show us just how crucial it is not to work with provincial averages, to really understand realities. Michelle touched on, and you'll see in a second, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself here, but so has a personal family doctor, 90%, varies from 70 to 96. Getting an appointment, same day, next day, and yes, it's possible, some people have that. A one in four, it varies from 7% to 50%. Getting an appointment within five days, 55% for the province, but 19 to 75. You see how it's important not to generalize on the provincial average. You can have much higher, much lower. So that means we have some communities that are doing extremely well. Some uh, doctor's offices are very well organized when it comes to that way, right? But others, not so, what, not so much. Uh, family doctors after hours arrangements, 17%, 16.8, from 4.7 to 26%. Family doctor has extended office hours, 15%, from 2.7 to 30%, okay? So you see how much it can vary? And what we've learned is it's not a rural urban, it's not a north-south, it's not a French-English, it's really about looking at the number and there are, it's a reality that a community is not doing that well or is doing extremely well in that area. So if you're in the health services planning and management business, extremely important to understand the population you're serving. Chronic conditions, if you think about healthcare in the 50s and 60s, and I always enjoy hearing people tell me how it worked prior to that, like you know how you paid the doctors and so on and so forth, but back then it was really about acute care. So a broken leg, a broken arm, appendicitis, it was about fix. It was about you know, cure, okay? This is about care. Chronic conditions have, have really evolved significantly over those decades. And now, when you look at this, one or more chronic conditions, we're talking about 60% of the population, okay, at least one. Then three or more, 20%. And when it comes to chronic conditions, most of them we can prevent completely. We can, if we did, if, if behaviors and everything else was, was good, we'd prevent them completely. But what's equally important is once people have one, if we can do a better job at equipping them to manage it, we can prevent the onset of those other ones. And you see below it says, the percentage who say they're very confident in managing their health conditions covers about 40%, okay? And many health professionals, many doctors, when I share this with them, they say, people say they're confident, but we're not even checking. <laughs> you know, maybe they say they're confident, but there's stuff they still don't know. So it, it, I don't seem to get a lot of confidence that that 40% is a hard 40. So it speaks to our system needing to do this, uh, making sure that we're valuing uh, uh, care as much as we're valuing cure. Because not caring for these people in the right way is going to cost us a whole lot. What's also interesting on this, and somewhat worrying, and it has everything to do with behaviors, it shows that, and my, the numbers we have are still fairly preliminary, we're not there yet, and we're working on making everything, is that we're finding the age group from 18 to 34 are having much higher prevalencies than our older generation. And when you think about that, those 65 now are probably less influenced by the sedentary and, and the types of foods and so on than that group. And we're seeing an onset of chronic conditions, much more important that younger group, which really worries me, Dishal, because 30 years from now, they're going to be the 60 years old. And if we, they already have those diseases now, imagine how bad shape they'll be 30 years from now, OK? Increase in people with three or more conditions. So of the percentage of those with three or more conditions, the increase between 2011 and 2014, it's not changed a lot in our numbers since 2014, but as you can see, um, Hamilton at 5.6%, Edmondston right ne near, nearby, 0.3. So there's something around the behaviors, there's something in that population needs to be understood. 
Uh, and you can see how much it varies. The central part, part here, 5.6, 3.8, 2.5, seeing a higher increase in those chronic conditions. Okay, so chronic conditions, a very important element to be looking at. Um, here's an example of a tool. When we work with these types of numbers, and this was around heart and stroke. So what you've got here is a tool, and you can't see it very well, but you can get it from our website, and you can get all of the communities are listed. But very simply what this is, is you've got a list here of a risk, associated risk, having hypertension, uh, hypertension, having diabetes, had their blood pressure checked in the past 12 months, had their cholesterol checked, whether they're obese, and you have the New Brunswick numbers. On this side is a list of communities with the little dots are simply whether they're above the provincial average. It's to help from an identification from a prevention perspective of where these communities could focus, okay? So when you see here, and you can't read this, but the first two are Campbellton and Nigawak, and they both have six dots where they're higher or it's, it speaks to an area where they need to focus on compared to the New Brunswick average. So an example as to how with a better use of this type of information, we can get much better at focusing our energies uh, and based on the realities of the communities, because not all communities have the same realities. This was extremely well received for those working on, on uh, heart and stroke, and, uh, and again, available from our website, and you can have a look at the list of communities. Here's a quote, and I'm gonna read it out, okay? I'm gonna read it out. It says, somehow, the value system of the healthcare organization will have to be revised so that the care of the chronically ill will be seen as rewarding as the cure of acute conditions. The need for the revision of this value system is already pressing and will become more so as the percentage of the aged in Canada's population increases. Does that sound like tonight's conversation? We're 2019. Anybody want to guess where this comes from? 30 years ago. 1974. 45 years ago, the Marc Lalonde Report, a new perspective on health of Canadians, a working document. How does that make you feel? <laughs> I'll tell you, in my job, it tells me I have a tough job ahead of me. I feel tired right now. I say to people this evening, I feel like I'm repeating myself over and over and over. Well, 45 years ago, people, 45 years ago, okay? And Vishal, if anything, has told us just how much urgent this is. But if you pick up that report, I think you'll find it an interesting read. Ken was one of those who suggested I read it 10 years ago when I came into this job, I believe. And I found it, and I just took it out recently because I do that time, some time to, you know, from time to time, you reread some stuff. And I found it really interesting as I was looking at tonight's conversation 45 years ago. We have a system that's very focused on equality. So equal distribution. That's why I started earlier by saying, talking to you a little bit about the history of the system and that push of being everywhere and where everything is. So we're really equal focused which is very different from equity focus. And if you, I like that image because the image means that in order to achieve that, you've had to appreciate the reality of each individual and look at what it, each individual needed in order to have equitable access to the same types of outcomes, okay? Currently, we treat you the same whether you're sick or not. Okay? We promote uh, healthy eating, whether you're obese or not, the same way. Uh, Jeffrey Sis Simpson wrote a book, Chronic Conditions, Dragging Canada in the 21st Century, and I asked him this question directly as to what he had learned going around the world, because here, as I'm doing citizen engagement, people really believe we gotta get back to prevention, and participation was the big thing everybody was saying. You remember the 70s, the 80s, participation, you know, and so on? So I shared that with him, and I said, what did you learn? When you write a book like that, get some money, you travel around the world, and you talk to people, and you learn a lot of stuff. He said, the jurisdictions that are very good at it, it's not because they do participation types of, uh, of publicity. It's because they've become very good 
at maximizing every interaction with the system around your needs. So they, in identifying the population and those that need it, they're very good at focusing on that population. That's how they are different than us. And that's how they're good on prevention, they're good at targeting, they're targeting the issues, they understand the needs of their population, and that's how they're better than us. And by the way, there isn't a jurisdiction in the world that's got it right on everything, but there are some that better on some things than others, and that's what, that was one of the, the observations. Now, in closing, uh, uh, one of the things I want to share with you is in June of 2018, we made, we made our, our latest recommendations pertaining to primary health care. Okay, so primary health care is that first point of contact, which today many people associate to doctors, but primary health care is not doctors, okay? It's, 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 it, there's many professions, there's many needs, and so on, so primary health care. The very first thing we identified in the first paragraph, and we had a lot of thinking around this, and people have got a lot of ideas, and people talk about EMRs, and a whole bunch of stuff, but we look at it from a performance perspective, and performance improvement perspective. So when I look at this, I go, how are we setting ourselves up to improve? No one currently is responsible for primary health. I will repeat, no one currently is responsible for primary health, okay? You have people responsible for segments, someone manages Medicare, somebody manages the recruitment, somebody manages, no, 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 no. A year ago, you had a year or a year half ago, you had a doctor here who was in the media. She was closing her clinic, worried what's going to happen to my patients and so on and so forth. The reality is, is no one's responsible for the Burton area. No one's responsible. So that first element was to say the minister should instruct the department and the RHAs to develop an accountability framework for which the RHAs should be responsible for and the management of. And we call it an accountability framework because it's not a thing of closing the lights on Friday and on Monday everything's solved. But yet we have to start looking at that accountability and making sure that for each part of New Brunswick it is clear who is responsible for understanding the situation. The very first point. The second element we said was we have to do better at establishing targets. And we, we provided examples. So the ability to be seen by one's primary health care provider. And when we're talking about the future, we never say doctors, we say primary care providers. Because the future has got to be about, I told you, in Canada we made two decisions. Hospitals and? So we're, we're, we're programmed around that. So looking to the future, we have to do a much better job at the ability to be seen by one's primary health provider within five days. And we said five days because our analysis is telling us that if people can see someone within four days or so, uh, they're okay, they won't go to the ER. But the reality is if we have essentially two realities, there's those who can see their doctor within the same day or next day, and then it's three, four, five weeks. It's those two kind of categories. So being able to see within five days, the coordination of care between primary health care providers and other health providers in places, so specialists, for example, and how are we coordinating that better and so on and so forth, the quality of communication between citizens and their primary health care provider, big issue. The other issue to access, as I hear by citizens, is one issue per visit, <laughs> right? They do not like that and they should not be doing that. So it's an example of something to improve. And the reduction of avoidable hospitalizations is because for chronic conditions, New Brunswick gets some of the highest numbers of hospitalization rates because we have more people with chronic conditions, but also we don't do a good job at managing those chronic conditions, so those people are hospitalized for them. The third one, which surprised people, we currently don't know what we have when it comes to doctors. We don't know. That is the simple reality. We do not know. There's head counts, okay, but we don't know. So people will assume right away where there's problems is because we don't have enough. But the reality is we don't know what we have, we don't have a good appreciation of how they're organized. And I'll give you a simple example. Two communities each have three family doctors. One community, the three, do five days a week of family practice. So they both have three doctors. The other one has one that does five days a week, and the other two are doing after hours clinics, ER, and those types of things. Are both communities equally served? No. Currently, no one 
really knows that. And that's why our very first point is we have to figure out who that one is who has to know that, and then we have to start managing that, right? So our recommendation last year was around that. We, it was very well received. I've yet to have anyone say it's not the right thing to do, but we're still waiting if, if there'll be traction around doing this. So finally, moving forward, population health needs, health service quality outcomes, and available resources by zones and communities are all three information areas that currently we are not adequately using to guide our decisions. And I gave you an example when it comes to resources, we for the most part don't know. Um, honestly, when, when, when I see the same numbers as Richard, the annual report number of employees, but I wouldn't really know. Uh, and so, you know, so we don't have a proper grasp of our resources and rule of thumb in New Brunswick we usually have more than the, than the national average. Usually, I say usually, I don't want to generalize. There are some exceptions, but usually we have more. Okay, so we're not doing a good use of the ones we have. Second point is target populations. High users. Um, I hear that about 5% of our users are using up about 65% of our resources. Ontario had a study looking at 1%, the one top percent of their users we're using 33% of health spending. So imagine if we, start, we had did a better job at identifying these people, better understanding their realities, what's causing the issues, how can we improve the service to them, is literacy an issue? Big one in New Brunswick, we give people pamphlets but they can't read, okay? So understanding the reality of the population we're serving and it's a big job if you're looking at 760,000 people, but what if we got better at identifying these individuals? and we improve things around those individuals, the, the benefits would have repercussions throughout the system. So that's my presentation, I thank you very much. We have Ken McGeorge coming up. Uh, he was uh, CEO of the Chalmers Hospital and co-chair of the New Brunswick Council on Aging, among other things, which he's going to talk to you about. Um, I got asked, with the previous government to co-chair, if you've not seen this, it's on the website, the New Brunswick Council on Aging and Suzanne de Puy Blanchard and, and I worked uh, feverishly for a year. Now before we took that co-chairmanship on, we asked uh, Kathy Rogers, who is a wonderful, highly respected minister, I, I, uh, I've come to admire her a whole lot, but um, she said, yeah, we, as I, my response to her was, look, every government for the last 20 years has created a report on seniors. That's just all part of the election earring game because it makes us believe that somebody actually cares. <laughs> and so it's fashionable in every four year cycle to have a report on seniors. That's the way it is. This is an old sour veteran that's talking to you here. Um, and so uh, she said, look, we absolutely want change. We're committed to change. So sign on, please. So we did. For one full year, Suzanne and I, along with 17 other people, but Suzanne and I in particular, devoted 50% of a year. Uh, it was like a ha another half-time job to co-chairing this, this uh, Council, and at the end of it, we produced a report which all the people in the system who were the re recipients of the report looked at it and said, man, that's got everything in it that could serve as a basis for reforming not only just, <coughs> um, not only just senior care, but healthcare generally, and if properly managed. Well, that was January 2017 when it was submitted, so what have you heard about it since? Uh, there you go. Uh, and so um, when Daryl said, I'm, I'm kind of wanting to do something, at least raise some visibility about some of the issues in the province, uh, and he mentioned health care amongst many other things that are of concern to him, I said, sign me on. So. What, what I'm going to share with you right now is, is a compilation of, um, he, he formed a little healthcare group 
within the coalition. Um, and some of the members are here tonight. Uh, yeah, Jim Carter and Wally Waller and um, Zhangi Finn. And we were kind of all veterans of the 1992 incursion in health. And so, um, and then Jim Wolstenholme helped us with a few things along the way. And so what you're gonna see uh, now is an amalgamation of all of that. Now let me share with you before we get into that, my own personal feeling about all of this and about the need for healthcare reform is based on uh, two or three things. To begin with, I've spent two thirds of my career outside New Brunswick, so, so I've had the pleasure of working um, in the Nova Scotia system, in the Ontario system for 20 odd years. No, they weren't odd years, they were wonderful years actually. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then here, well, here we are. Um, see if we can get these slides to advance. Here's what the coalition team has done thus far. We've reviewed the history of healthcare in this province and, and um, Stefan has outlined some of that for you this evening. Um, there have been reports after going way back, um, Llewellyn Davies Weeks. There are some people here who remember that one that goes back about 50 years and on and on. New Brunswick is not short on having reports on how to do things. <laughs> um, numerous reports. We assessed, gave some, not in detail, we didn't do a big research project, but we assessed gener generally why progress has been so slow, while other jurisdictions have innovated and, and developed faster than us, and, and that is a truism. They have. Uh, other jurisdictions are way ahead of us in primary care, urgent care, the whole nine yards. Uh, we've listened to a number of experts, so this is not, what you're seeing here is not just Ken talking or Wally talking or Jim or Daryl, it's, it's a product of what we've heard from other people. We hear about no structured urgent care network and, and you see that. And, and, which is kind of interesting because my daughter moved to another jurisdiction just two years ago and when we go to visit her there's an urgent care center on every strip mall and, and all linked to the base hospital which is really quite interesting. Um, we hear about frail elderly in acute care beds and mostly not stated in positive uh, terms. We hear about the long waits for medical specialist services. Heard some of that at coffee break just this morning from some, some guys again. And of course the intermittent staffing crises. I, I remember the first in my own personal career, um, way back in 1970, I think when I was in Halifax, being summoned to an urgent meeting to talk about, guess what? the nursing crisis. Couldn't hire, couldn't, couldn't find them, had to make changes, all of this. So some things kind of never change. What government sees is service provision problems, um, of course, of all descriptions, wait times, duplication, the minister hears that all the time. Um, they know, as I know and you know, that um, there is some wonderful care. It's not all gloom and doom. There's some great stuff that happens in this province. Um, and, um, but we also hear about the competition within and amongst the nursing, uh, amongst the professions, doctor, nurses, nurses. Within, I, I did that two part series a couple of weeks ago on, on uh, the nursing crisis and was astounded in doing some of the research as to the infighting and the animosity and the stuff that's gone on that, is, that still goes on within the interest groups within, just within that profession. And you try to find a solution <coughs> when there's that level of uh, competition and infighting. Um, boy, I don't know who's gonna do that. It's gonna take a Lee Iacocca or something. 
Um, the alarming rate of growth of cost, of course, we've heard about the interest groups calling for change. Every interest group that I've talked with, and I've, I have physicians in my, I have a few physicians who like me, um, and, we, and we, we stay connected, and nurses, and uh, everybody wants change. Everybody wants, everybody will acknowledge that we have got to do a better job, so long as it doesn't affect me. Governance, um, I, I sure don't, and there are others uh, who've been part of our team and others that we have consulted with who feel like the governance structure for the health authorities and other elements needs to be at least reviewed. And of course, recurring health crises. First of all, it's shocking that this area, health and long-term care that represents what is it now, 42, 46% of the annual operating budget. There is no plan to guide it. And as Stefan made reference to that so eloquently just a little while ago. In 1992, when the hospitals were regionalized, that was thought to be at that point phase one of a several phase plan to creating a true health system but a succession of governments starting in the late years of McKenna and on, on and on, I think, personally, have, gotten, have kind of got cold feet and backed away from the idea of a plan. And so we have what you described uh, earlier so well. The system is far too complex for simplistic solutions. Everybody you talk with has their silver bullet if they would only fill in the blanks. The system is way too complex. Matter of fact, I, last year, when I was still leave, living in uh, Brown's Flat and commuting into Fredericton now and again, I would have often a couple of hours to kill between meetings, and so I'd go and sit in the legislature and listen to some of the silver bullets being fired around there, and it was, it was it sure was not edifying, but it, it was entertaining. Um, but I'd sit and listen to some of the comments being, being made, and I'd say, who in the world ever drafted that briefing note? So it's way too complex. Um, Ontario saw that. Back to my friend Duncan Sinclair. Back in the 90s, when there, the all the major teaching hospitals were competing for, I mean, you weren't just talking millions of dollars, you were talking billions of dollars of capital requirements to replace and remodel and upgrade and whatever. And Dunk Sinclair was chosen by the government to head up an external, what is called health restructuring commission. And he led that commission for at least five years and the, the, process, the, the purpose was to restructure the system and to create some order to, the, to these huge capital investments that were being proposed. Um, but they had to get it. The, what they recognized was because things were so complicated, they had to get it out of the conventional civil service political milieu where people who could research the issues, deal with the issues based on evidence, based on fact, without <coughs> the worry of getting reelected next year. And therein lies the issue, in my opinion. So then the need for organizational culture change in healthcare, um, the system has been historically and still is very provider-centric run for the convenience of providers, not necessarily for the convenience of uh, patients. And uh, in the long-term care sector right now, I'm overjoyed to know that there are a number of facilities that are really heavily into culture reform and creating a, a whole different approach to managing their facilities. 
And finally, I wrote, wrote on this in the Telegraph as well, the need for accountability for performance, care results, and the value for resources provided. I had the pleasure a few years ago um, of attending a workshop that was presented by the Vice President of the American, um, American Association of Medical Centers. It was a collection of Mayo Clinics, Cleveland Clinic, Leahy Clinic, all of those high-end operations. And you might think, as some do, when you make reference to places like Mayo and others, th that the difference between them and us is all about money. It ain't, trust me, it's not. It's all about organizational discipline and engagement. Sure, they make a whole lot more money than we do, I understand that, but that really is not the essential ingredient. We believe that a, a whole new approach to running healthcare has got to be figured out, which starts with uh, best practice standards and, 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 and really meaning that. I mean, we give a lot of lip service to best practice, but um, uh, it really doesn't uh, show up on the street. We believe that uh, centers of service expertise needs to be created. Horizon did a masterful job uh, a few years ago of creating a strategic plan based on creating centers of expertise. Um, and we just, as we have thought about it, now we're not in the fray every day like John McGarry and others are, but uh, boy, in this small province, having multiple competitive clinical services multiple chest units, multiple GI. When my daughter was having a struggle, which went on for about 15 years with GI issues, I kept asking, where is the center of expertise in the province for GI? And I couldn't find out what the answer was, and I still don't know. We believe very clearly that around the province there need to be multidisciplinary primary care centers as a system access point for all New Brunswickers. When Roy Romano was doing his big report a few years ago, he stopped into Sault Ste. Marie and toured the Sault Ste. Marie Clinic, which has been in operation now for about 40 years. And it's a completely multidisciplinary, one-stop shop. Um, and he, he came out of there saying, man, this is the best kept secret in the country, and it is. And it got off the ground, not by virtue of any particular governmental plan or directive, but the unions made it happen. And they took the bull by their horns, they recruited some physicians and others who wanted to work with them, and the rest is history. We need innovative action to fix what's broken and keep it fixed. If we had that plan that we talked about way back in 1992, what would it look like? Well, it would have, it, it would talk about the what, where, how, who, um, and the why. And it, it would uh, provide a framework for uh, laying out clearly where the physical facilities are gonna be, where the clinics are gonna be, you know, but it would be based on some evidence-based plan as, a as opposed to uh, the last bit of political pressure that was applied. Anyway, these are kind of key elements that would be involved in such a plan. Do I, I hope that we'll get somewhere closer to that at some point, uh, but it sure won't happen unless the citizenry erupt, I think. What can the public do? And the reason that we're experimenting with this forum tonight, and if this seems to have been helpful, then we would certainly be interested in taking the show on the road. But the public needs to understand that major change is needed, and, and uh, it's not just tinkering change. And it's not just fixing the ambulance issue today and some other issue tomorrow. There's a, there's a whole host of issues that have got to be dealt with strategically and 
you know as well as I know that any change in New Brunswick, uh, however small, creates pandemonium and, <laughs> and great unrest for politicians. And so um, the, the, be the best thing the public can do is understand that there is a need for a major process cha uh, of change. And that change always generates heat and the whole not in my backyard phenomenon. I repeat again, healthcare has no easy magic silver bullet. I keep hearing the bullets from all over the place, but honest and truly, uh, we do a disservice to those who would make a difference by oversimplifying the issues. NB has the resources for excellence, but certainly not as currently structured and operated. Absolutely, I, I'd take that one to the bank. We need to learn from systems that are outperforming NB and simply ask why and why not here. So why not look at some of those models that are out there? We can learn from systems that are outperforming us I think the issues are so big and so convoluted and challenging that if they're ever going to be dealt with, somehow they're going to get outside the existing systems. Um, somewhat like Ontario did with the healthcare restructuring, but I'm not suggesting that as the model, but some, somehow the, this stuff has got to get out there and dealt with by people of good will and good faith. One of the messages we've been giving to elected officials has been because these things are so numerous and so critical and so important and so convoluted and so politically sensitive, Jeffrey Simpson regard, referred to healthcare as the third rail in Canadian politics and he's absolutely right. We've got to get all parties to understand how, how serious this is and how, how serious is the need for change. Um, and we can't allow the silliness that goes on between parties over things that don't matter to, to prevail on this file. It's too important. And there we are. Mm -hmm. I think we need to sort of look at um, what kind of systems can we put in place. I understand some communities have uh, things like, you know, the ambulance people, instead of just sitting in their ambulance, might go to selected people and check to make sure that uh, you're not having problems with medications or other things like that. Uh, you might be able then to contact uh, uh, a nurse or whatever to begin to sort of get some kind of response, but you can pull in people. Um, so, but we're still sort of very doctor-centric, uh, health-centric. We're waiting for you to get ill before you uh, actually deliver something. So I, I think we need to get beyond thinking of health in the silo of just hospitals, uh, primary care centers, and look at how we can, in actual fact, set up community resources to minimize the need for that on silos, being patient center, and the data issue. Uh, just to share with you, one of the exercises that we're doing later in August, we're bringing social development, uh, uh, A and B, uh, extramural, uh, Department of Health, uh, health authorities, and we've actually worked around the numbers, and it's a continuity of a conversation we had earlier this spring about the element as a system that we need to do a better job at identifying individuals. Who are these people? Right? And, these peop and we're bringing the various stakeholders around the table so they understand in Miramichi, we're talking about 101 individuals. Who are they? What are their realities? Social development, what are your uh, interactions with these people? What do we know about them? And how are we maximizing our current resources to ensure that we're not uh, you know, duplicating our efforts and, 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 whatnot and, so, and so on? We were blessed with uh, probably the best quality of life any generation has ever been given. 
and uh, probably should be aware of that and help prepare what follows. So you start from the conclusion that Mr. McGeorge made and <clears throat> this centricism, you look at uh, the present structure and the present governance structure and the statistics we are provided are uh, mostly from the primary hospital, et cetera, healthcare system, existing healthcare system, and it does not focus on where we are now immediately headed because some of, many of the healthcare services are provided by the social services department. So uh, those are the notes I was writing in the first two presentations. The second one, when Stefan was speaking, my question was, and it's probably in, in comment form now, are we accounting health expenditures or are we accounting for later life health needs, i.e. nursing home care, uh, care which tends to be accounted for by social services department? And I made the same sort of note when uh, Mr. Sayan was speaking, health stats, do they include social services which controls the nursing home expenditures? So it, it's just like a short circle, and that's the conclusion. It, it's really a question, and it has to do with our present structure is not going to provide the solutions. On new structures, um, being someone who speaks to people in all the jurisdictions on an ongoing basis, the general consensus uh, when, when that movement of the early 2000s went where everybody was going from X to X minus whatever number of structure was people needed to take a break on structures. Structures deliver absolutely nothing. People do. So what we've not done is how we organize ourselves. We've not changed that. We've changed the structures, but we work exactly the same way. So we can absolutely make the current structures work. We just have to work differently. Okay. I'm wondering how we can get more data and evidence from our health authorities, from our nursing homes. Uh, I read a lot of, I read all of uh, everybody's stuff. I even read Ken's stuff about uh, uh, the nursing crisis. So uh, what, what can we do about that? Because here at the New Brunswick Nurses Union, uh, we've been filing about 50 right to information requests over the last six months. Uh, none of that information is public. So. How many people knew there was 4.5 violent incidents at hospitals each day in New Brunswick? Uh, when I read Stefan's stuff, I know all about how people feel about the food or the nursing care, but I don't know a lot about the nurse who's worked a 48-hour shift that same day, right? So what's overtime like? These are the types of data that I'm interested in, so how can we do that? Believe me, and we're where we started, we are data rich, information poor, but we have to except that we've organized ourselves in such a way that we make decision in absence of that type of information. So it's, it's that type of work. It's a long journey. And I know it's not addressing completely your point and the points about the staff information and all that, and it's all extremely valid. Communities have gone a long way at gobbing up our data. Communities, to the examples around health initiatives and so on and so forth, very quick to gob that. But our government structures, all of our departments, very slow to change because we've learned to work without the info. In this current political system, would you reconcile the fact that, of course we're talking about healthcare, but it, healthcare is a portion of an economy. Healthcare is paid for by taxpayers' money, but it, it's obviously not the only thing that has to be paid for. So how do you reconcile then in this political system where we flip-flop governments for the last 20-some years, where even the electorate, you know, uh, you're not going to see results in a four-year term, especially if it doesn't happen at the beginning of a political mandate. The electorate doesn't see something happen, so we flip-flop and we start over. The healthcare system, the voting cycles, how do you reconcile all of that together to give us the best healthcare Political. Very first discussion of the council, how do we take politics out of, of, out of health care? I actually participated in that conversation. But very quickly I realized we never will, to Lichelle's point, never will. 
what we have to talk about is how do we appropriately in include politics in healthcare? That's the discussion we need to have. And around that, what you have to understand when it's about healthcare is there's actually rules about the role of the minister, the role of the RHAs. That's why I'm, not su I'm suggesting we don't need to change structures. But the minister, and it's no fault of the minister of the day, it's about how what we're currently expecting of the minister as elected officials, right, is not playing the role that he's meant to play. So you can expect healthcare to be the top number one priority in New Brunswick for the next 10 to 15 years at least, okay? So it will be heavily politicized. People will try to come up with their own answers and their own solutions. And at some point, some people might take politicians more to account, but the way that this is done is through public education. Um, billing numbers for physicians, if I have a billing number, is that still a good way for physicians to be paid, whether that's it? So I kind of wonder if we don't have a pretty good foundation that we can tweak and build on and not have to wait 10, 20 years for politicians to get their act together. Uh, that's just my thought. Tweaking the system, um, I think there are some areas in which some radical changes are needed. One of the great missing links in our province is, is good leadership. Um, we have leadership in certain areas of the system, but other key areas where leadership is wanting. Uh, in one of my recent articles, I, I use the term in talking about accountability, everybody's responsibility is nobody's responsibility. And that's why so many broke, this, this document outlines systems that are in place that should be helping seniors stay at home safely that have been broken for 20 years, for heaven's sakes. And are we any closer to fixing those systems now than we were 20 years ago? How many more elections do you have to fight to Get out some, I mean, this is, this is not election winning stuff. We are non-political, and so you are part of the parade. You are the people that can make it happen because you're part of the parade, and if, the, if you start, if you continue with the parade, the leaders will lead, and that's what you have to do. Thank you for coming. <laughs>